Welcome back, everyone. And for our next session, we have payment planning and execution for the Lightning Network with Renee Pickhart. So I'd like to welcome up Renee to the stage. Renee is researching on improving the payment reliability on the Lightning Network and is employed at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He is a co-author of the book, Mastering the Lightning Network, and an educator on YouTube and Stack Exchange. In his other life, he studied mathematics and offers consulting on statistics and counting things properly, which in modern times is called data science consulting. Thank you, Renee. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I hope everything works with the screen sharing. So you should be able to see my screen right now, but this is the wrong one, sorry. Good. Okay, perfect. So hello, everybody. Today, I'm gonna to talk about payment planning and execution for the Lightning Network. This is um, pretty novel research that we have just shared, I think two or three weeks ago on archive and the Lightning Dev mailing list. And today's topic is going to be first a recap of onion routing on the Lightning Network. So this should be mostly familiar to everybody of you. Um, we're gonna do a very quick recap of the current payment uh, delivery process on the Lightning Network and then talk about probabilistic pathfinding. Uh, since I was lurking into the talks in the beginning of this day, I decided to, to start with this recap of the Omnion routing and omit the later parts of the talk. Uh, so, so to have somebody to pick up everybody who might not be completely familiar with what's happening on the Lightning Network. So uh, if you are too bored in the first half of the talk, um, don't leave. I promise you the second half is getting to be way more interesting and, and way more novel. Um, so if you want to do a payment on the Lightning Network, um, the regular workflow between Alice and let's say David, uh, who's going to be paid is that David is going to present a bold 11 invoice. And this includes, of course, a payment hash that comes from some payment uh, secret or pre-image. And um, David is presenting this invoice, for example, via QR code to Alice. And then uh, what Alice does is she looks at the gossip protocol of the Lightning Network. Um, and then she will select a path over several payment channels. So this path might go from Alice to Bob, to Charlie, and then to David. Um, and for us to understand a little bit better what is really going on here, I will denote a few numbers here. And the numbers that you can read is the actual balance that is in each of these channels. So the channel between Alice and Bob uh, has 902 Satoshi on Alice's side and 500 Satoshis on Bob's side. And the, channel between Bob and Charlie has 701 Satoshi on Bob's side and 100 uh, Satoshi on Charlie's side, and similarly on the Charlie and David channel. And of course, from Alice's perspective, she will only be aware of this balance as the other channel balances are not uh, public knowledge to Alice um, usually. Um, but of course, Bob and Charlie know what the balance is and Charlie and David know what their balance is. So after Alice has uh, selected this part because it looked fine to her or her implementation selected this path and it looked fine to her. Um, what she does is she creates an onion package. Um, and this is just for visual representation in order to understand the general gist. You don't have to understand all the numbers. Um, if there is one number that I, I really want you to understand is basically this red mark number here, which means 300 Satoshi is going to be forwarded from Charlie to David, 300 Satoshi from Bob to Charlie and 301 Satoshi um, this is uh, also going to be forwarded in the first channel. Um, so what then happens on a protocol level is that um, Alice and uh, Alice will um, send an update at HTLC message and negotiate a new HTLC on her channel with Bob. So as you recall, in the beginning, Alice had 902 Satoshi in her channel, but she will add an HTLC of size um, 302. Uh, and this is a conditional payment that goes to Bob. So Alice has reduced her amount yet, but Bob doesn't have his new account updated. Um, she has an HTLC, so, though, so if, if Bob is able to provide the um, pre-image, remember this is what initially the payment on David's side started with, um, Bob will be able to claim this HTLC and redeem it and, and add this to his balance. Um, why is 302 and not 301? Well, in the update add HTLC message, um, Alice sends this onion over to Bob. Bob decodes this onion and learns, oh, I am supposed to forward 301 Satoshis on the next channel to Charlie. So this is exactly what Bob is going to do. And I don't know why always two slides uh, emerge. Um, so, so Bob will forward 301 Satoshi. 
uh, which is one Satoshi less. So this one Satoshi difference is the routing fee that uh, Bob is going to earn on this payment. Um, of course, only if the payment finally arrives. And you can see Bob's um, amount is now discounted and the HTLC is kind of depicted on Charlie's side. Um, if Charlie is able to provide the uh, pre-image, then Charlie can settle. But with the pre-image, of course, Bob can settle, so everybody is happy. So what Charlie will do now is um, Charlie will also forward the HTLC to David. And since David wanted to get paid 300 Satoshi from Alice, David will be very happy to release the pre-image. Um, and now we see there is an update fulfill HTLC message being propagated from David back to Charlie together with the pre-image. The HTLC is canceled and David updates his balance. Um, and of course, what Charlie will do is Charlie will do the same and update his own balance. Um, and then finally, Bob will do this thing and everybody is happy on the Lightning Network. This is the theory um, and in practice, also this is kind of happening, um, but we face a really big problem in reality. And the problem in reality is, is that the actual workflow looks like this. Um, Alice starts the payment. Um, Bob might be able to forward the payment, but then Charlie realizes that Charlie only has 250 Satoshi um, in the channel and David has 250 Satoshi in the channel. So Charlie is not able to, to um, put in an HTLC into this channel because David would never accept this because Charlie doesn't have enough funds. So Charlie discovers, oh, I don't have enough liquidity to forward the HTLC. So what will happen is, um, Charlie will send back an error message with an update fail HTLC and a reason, which could indicate that there is not enough balance in this channel. The HTLC is canceled again. And then Bob, of course, will also propagate the error backwards to Alice and also cancel out the HTLC. So um, this is uh, the situation. Of course, David might have helped Alice to prevent this by um, giving a routing hint. So David could have said, yeah, there are some channels in which I can actually receive uh, 350, uh, 300 Satoshis. So um, the actual workflow of a payment and a retry with a route hint would be um, use the channel of, of Carla, right? So what our picture now looks like is that Alice can use her channel with Bobby and she also knows that Carla and David have a channel, but there is still something in the middle between Bobby and Carla, which Alice has no control over. So Alice will try this. She will uh, create an HTLC uh, and send an update at HTLC message. Um, but then Carla is not responding <laughs> to the update at HTLC message. And this, of course, is a problem again, because Bobby is now not able to um, establish a new HTLC. So Bobby will um, send an error back to Alice. And I think you get the idea, right? And if you have used the Lightning Network in the past, you, you might have had this experience that you pay something and it goes really quick. You wait one or two seconds and you have paid it. Um, or you are in this situation like I was one year ago or one and a half years ago at the Lightning Conference when I bought these beautiful headphones from a friend. Um, we didn't have a direct payment channel, but I paid him over the Lightning Network some, some mini Bitcoin. And we had to wait about, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 seconds. And obviously, because the amount was pretty large, we had to try several parts, uh, paths until finally we have been able to deliver the payment. So um, yeah, this is the situation of the Lightning Network. And it's one of the huge criticisms uh, that is out there in the Lightning Network. Um, before I went to Norway to, to do this um, research position, I actually listened to what Bitcoin did with Peter McCormick. Uh, and he had, I think, Peter Risen invited a Bitcoin critic, and uh, this pathfinding problem was one of the problems. And then I thought, well, maybe we can tackle this. So this is what we're going to look at for the remainder of the talk. So let's look at the pathfinding and the payment process on the Lightning Network. Um, and let's try to recap the actual payment process, how it's currently implemented in most implementations. Um, I have to say the pathfinding is not part of the bold specifications, so different implementations can do whatever they wish. Uh, the only thing that is really specified is the onion routing and the gossip protocol and the fact that we don't know the balance information. So in general, um, our pathfinding and our payment process is based on a trial and error loop. What this means is, uh, the sender will select a suitable path based on, and suitable is really like a question for us developers to define what we mean with this. 
right? So currently they think it's suitable if it's based on routing keys. So for example, you might prefer paths over nodes and channels that are rather cheap to be routed. Um, or there are CLTV data and other metadata like how big are the HTLCs and how much security do you want for time locks if something hits the chain? Um, how long do you give yourself to time out in the on-chain case? Um, and then of course, a, a very simple metric that one should respect is the capacities of the channels have to be larger than the actual payment amount, right? So if I have 100,000 Satoshi uh, payment channel and I want to send 200,000 Satoshis over this channel, this is obviously impossible. So these are some of the metrics that are currently being used to select a path. And this path then is basically select randomly. Um, once this is done, um, an onion is being constructed and sent out. And as I just explained, if there's an error, we just repeat this entire loop. We start from the beginning. We just select another suitable path based on our criteria. We, we rinse and repeat until we hopefully finally um, find something. There's one exception to the rule. Potentially, we might be splitting the payment into smaller amounts and use multi-path payments. Um, and we're going to discuss in this talk if this is actually a viable strategy or not. Um, what we know from experience is most likely this uses several attempts to actually deliver the payment. Uh, it rarely happens that you just like send out one onion and, and it is successful. Of course, if the amount is small and if, if it's a neighboring channel, then it might work. But in general, you might have to try several times. And this can take uh, a lot of time. Um, I think there have been plenty of studies that show that sending out an onion and waiting for the HTLCs to settle or for an error to come back might take two to three seconds on the medium time, I think. Um, and of course, if there is the uh, on-chain case of channels break and HTLC timeouts kick in, then it can take even much longer time, um, which I want everybody to understand can be very problematic if you are, let's say, in a grocery store and you want to pay uh, with Bitcoin over the Lightning Network. Um, I mean, settling in one or two seconds, that's awesome. Um, Settling in a minute, that's not so great if everybody behind you has to wait. And obviously, if you understand the Lightning Network protocol, as soon as you send out the onion, everything is beyond your control. You cannot cancel the onion. You cannot do anything anymore. You have to just basically wait and pray to see what happens, um, which is currently not a good user experience um, in, in a real world scenario. Um, and then, of course, eventually it might fail because every attempt that you made failed. Um, so, so what I want you to understand is this entire protocol is by design not reliable. Um, and the, the, the question in the remainder of this talk is how can we make this more reliable working with this uncertainty? So what I'm proposing to do is uh, to use a probabilistic path selection. Um, and what this means is uh, actually every node can already do this today. We don't need any protocol level change. We can just do it on an implementation level. We can write a C Lightning plugin like I did for my node in order to test this stuff. Uh, and that's really great. Um, it addresses mainly the issue of uncertain balances and the balance information has to be uncertain. If we would not uh, keep it uncertain, but share it at, after every payment, we would have to broadcast every payment of the Lightning Network to every node. And that sounds very familiar to the Bitcoin network where every transaction is broadcasted to everybody, which yields the biggest scaling um, uh, challenges, right? It's, it's not the block space that is the problem. It's the problem of propagating all that information to everybody in the network. Um, other failure situations that we have described that are not uh, with respect to uncertain channel balances can be modeled in a similar way, but the likelihood of them to occur are just much lower. So we're focusing on the uncertain channel balances. And then the main idea is very simple, actually. Uh, what I'm saying is, hey, let's try the path with the highest success probability, right? I mean, uh, I would say uh, a kid in middle school could come up with this idea and say, hey, I'm, I'm choosing the thing that is most likely to happen. Um, and then, of course, what we could also do is we could update the knowledge during the payment process if we have some errors or some success rates. I think some implementations are already doing this. So let's start with some math. We start with the channel failure probability in the uniform case. So um, payments for an amount A fail if the channel has a balance of less than A, right? And the probability is the sum of each balance values between 0 and A. And a quick um, Note, we use uniform distributions as we observe them by probing the network. So what we did in the beginning of this research, um, we probed the Lightning Network basically by sending out a lot of fake payments to everybody. 
and check the error messages in order to understand how is the balance in the channel distributed. Is it on one side, is it on the other side, or is it like mixedly distributed? And what we saw is that um, when, when we plotted this on a diagram, that the distribution of balance values across the entire network is mainly following the uniform distribution. So for, for our research, it was fair to assume this. We were quite surprised by this. We assumed it would be a normal distribution. Um, but however, everything that I will explain to you also works with other distributions. Um, so the channel failure probability can be expressed using a random variable by saying, hey, what is the probability for the random variable being smaller than a? And of course, this is just the sum of the random variable taking every value between 0 and a minus 1. And as I just said, if you, if you use uniform distributions, um, every value that the random variable could take is 1 over c plus 1, where c is the capacity of the channel. So this is a divided by c plus 1, a pretty simple math formula. Um, of course, uh, when we want to select the most likely paths, we want to have not the ones where we have the highest failure probability, but the success probability. So we go the other way around and define the channel success probability. Well, obviously, a payment is successful if it doesn't fail. So expressed in probability theory, this is just 1 minus the failure probability. And for a fixed capacity C and uniform distributions, we always have these li nice little quotients that uh, can very easily be computed. And already from this formula, you see that if uh, the capacity is very large, this number will be close to one. And if the capacity is really close to the amount that you send, um, this will be some, uh, close to zero. Um, so you can see on large channels, you have a high success probability, whereas on small channels, you have a low success probability, as everybody intuitively um, would assume. But then, of course, a payment path consists of several channels. So one needs to be successful in every hop. So what we do is we just build the product of all the channel success probabilities for every channel i in the um, in the path. And the same holds true for multipath payments via several paths, right? So it's still the same um, product formula only here in the back. We, we might have to adjust a little bit because multipaths could later on share uh, channels again. So they're not necessarily disjoint. Um, but we can give an upper bound for the probability if we assume that small p is the highest per, lock, uh, per hop likelihood in a multipath, and L is the number of uncertain channels. We have this nice formula, and this shows that the probabilities fall exponentially um, with the number of uncertain channels. Um, so as an example, I, I want you to think about how large is L um, when four nodes are involved. So in the setting of L is Bob, Charlie, and David again. Uh, and, and if you think a little bit about it, you will realize the following. Alice knows her balance, so there's no uncertainty. David gave a route hint with Charlie, so there's also no uncertainty. Only the Bob and Charlie channel is uncertain. So in this case, we only have uh, the path success probability being equal to the channel success probability between Bob and Charlie, um, because we can, we can utilize this knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some trivial observations. Channel capacities need to be larger than the amount. Uh, smaller payments have a larger success probability, which is the main motivation for multipart payments, as the amount is getting smaller when you split the payment into amounts. The success probability, however, drops exponentially with a number of uncertain channels. So um, this is a motivation against multipart payments. And, and you can already see there is a tension between um, um, these two things with considering two multipart payments. Um, and the information from failed attempts can, as I said, be used to update probabilities. And the entire payment process then resembles a Bernoulli trial with this formula. So where S is the success probability and N is the number of um, attempts and K is the number of successful attempts, this will be our probability. And um, of course, what we can do is we can try to resolve this um, for N uh, when we know that we have to have at least k equal one successes in order to deliver a payment or a larger k in the case of multi-part payment. So um, we can compute the expectation value uh, of this formula, which is this curve. And we can basically see, depending on the path success probability, this is the number of expected attempts that we need in order to deliver the payment. And you can basically compare this to a dice roll. I mean, how often do you expect to roll a dice until you have one six, maybe six times, right? And then we can basically use this formula to define service level agreements. So we can ask ourselves, um, how often um, do we have to um, 
sent out an omnion to achieve with a probability of a certain degree that the payment will be delivered. So depending on the path success probability, the number of attempts will rise. Um, and you can actually see that uh, if you study the proof, and I just give it here for you to, to study it later, um, that uh, yeah, we, we have these curves and already in a, in a setting where we have a path success probability of 0.5, we need about 20 uh, attempts in order to um, achieve a delivery with a really high success probability. But we can quantify this number, so this is really great. Um, and then what we can also do is we can predict when a payment should be split, right? So we can use these formulas. And in this experiment, what we did is we had a theoretic split, which are the lines. And then we simulated this um, on, on our probe data. And we basically looked uh, with the dots here if that confirmed our theory. And we could actually see. So if the payment amount is uh, rather small, we have a high path success probability. So here, the lowest number of attempts that are needed are in the single case scenario. Uh, and then, of course, at some point in time, we have to go to a two split. And maybe later, we have to go to a three split. Um, and, and this all confirms really nicely. I will just quickly jump over this uh, and show you um, one or two final slides, <laughs> um, which is basically the main experiment. So. On the actual probed data, what we did is we looked at the baseline algorithm and saw how many average number of attempts were necessary to send certain amounts of bitcoins. And then we um, did the same with our um, paths, not selected by fees, but selected by probabilities, by highest success probability. And we see that in all cases, um, this dropped a lot. And um, one, one, one thing that I want to mention before I conclude this talk is um, I did a previous paper about locally rebalancing channels. And when we applied the same rebalancing algorithms, what we saw is that the actual um, balances shift from a uniform distribution to a normal distribution. And this is really great because um, if, you, if you then look at the results, um, this curve and this curve where as before, but for low amounts, you see that the rebalanced network with the regular pathfinding works as good as the probabilistic pathfinding. But of course, for higher amounts, rebalancing doesn't help so much anymore. So it goes back to the um, to the regular algorithm. But of course, if you combine the rebalancing with the maximum likelihood, you actually see that you get a really, really good pathfinding. And on average, you just need one attempt in order to deliver the payment. So this is really great. Um, the paper is out on archive. You can you can read it up, and of course you can hit me with questions. I will certainly join the Gaza punk, uh, dot town. And yeah, I'm happy that I got invited here. And uh, sorry for the hustle with the presentation in the beginning, and for talking maybe a little bit too quickly. Thank you, Renee. We actually have a few audience questions for you now. All right. Uh, so the first question is. You mentioned that there are liquidity issues with the Lightning Network. Do you think this is a space that larger players such as banks and hedge funds can fill or why would you not want them to do so? Um, so what I'm currently researching is with respect to, so, so I know that implementations are interested to changing the pathfinding probably towards this direction. Maybe not exactly our algorithms, but using this probabilistic pathfinding. And then, of course, you can use this to ask yourself, where do I need to assign um, liquidity in order to be very useful for the Lightning Network? Um, and I'm actually working on this. So there has been prior work on autopilots. And for me, follow-up research will certainly go in this direction. And I have been talking to some stakeholders and banks about these things. So I think it's actually a very interesting thing. And of course, if you want to reach out, um, yeah, feel free to do so. I think this is a great opportunity. And I think it's actually, a little bit similar to what we see with other coins with staking, right? Because you provide your Bitcoin and then you can earn a yield on it, which are the routing fees. And especially when you go to this probabilistic pathfinding, mm -hmm. uh, people might be willing to pay higher routing fees. So currently it's very easy to just like do dumping on the routing fees by just being cheaper and you have the path. 
But now when you provide liquidity, you actually provide a service because the probability rises. So you can charge for this. Mm -hmm. So I think um, an, an actual fee market will emerge and this will become very lucrative. But that's just my hypothesis being a mathematician and not uh, an economics guy. <laughs> so I'm actually the wrong person to ask that question. <laughs> awesome. Well, we got one more for you here. Um, um, could this probabilistic approach also be used to identify the most useful new channels to open to maximize the success rate of unknown future transactions? Um, I'm, I'm not completely sure if I understand the question fully, to be honest. So um, let, me, let me try to say what I understand from it. Okay. Um, in general, it makes sense to introduce probability theory to predict certain things, right? Right now, using this doesn't make too much sense because the pathfinding is still mostly based on the fees. So what you would currently do is you would basically compute the between the centrality and optimize your between the centrality on the fee graph, which is quite tricky because the fees are the base fee and the fee rate, so they depend on the actual amounts. So it's a little bit tricky. And of course, the between the centrality assumes that all payment pairs are equally likely. However, if implementations start changing towards this probabilistic approach, you would use exactly this one to predict where you want to assign your liquidity. So yes, um, it's, 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 it's a little bit tricky and, and there's no clear answer to it as of now, I would say, at least okay. in the way how I understood the question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then one final one in the, in the last minute, could it ever All be right. possible to open channels among three or more individuals instead of only two? Uh, so um, the answer, I think, is yes, but not with the current protocol. So we currently use the penalty-based um, mechanism for payment channels, and that um, uses a lot of communication overhead between channel stakeholders. Uh, however, Christian Decker has suggested to make L2 channels, and I think we need another yet another Bitcoin fork in order to get that. Uh, you know, these things that are easy to update and upgrade. But once we have them, um, multi-party channels and channel factories become ridiculously easy because the channel state is symmetrically shared across everybody. Um, so, so while it would technically, from an engineering perspective, to be possible to have a three or four-party channel right now, it would be very nasty to do so. So I think. With respect to the bolts, everybody is probably going to wait until we have the um, the L2 channels. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing thank, your time with thank us. Thank you for having me. It was really great. <laughs> awesome.